Well, we're studying Matthew's gospel and especially how Matthew depicts Jesus as the king of the kingdom of heaven. He describes a lot of the work that he does and what he says and so on and so forth, but if you read through Matthew, you notice that there's a particular way that he describes Jesus, and that is as a kingly or a royal figure. So Matthew recounts much of the same events and teachings as the other gospel writers, but as I said, his gospel, uh, in his gospel, we're able to trace this particular theme above, above others. So, so far we've seen various ways that Matthew has referred to Jesus' royal person, but in the following section, we're going to see Jesus actually force the issue among his apostles. In other words, he knows who he is, Matthew's describing how he is, but now Jesus is going to try to open the eyes of his apostles to recognize him as the king. Okay? In other words, he's going to make his apostles come to and admit the conclusion that only he is the ruler, only he is the king. Now when we last saw the Lord and His apostles, they were in the northern part of the country near their hometowns around the Sea of Galilee. That's the last scene that we had. After He finishes His ministry in this area, Jesus will go south towards Jerusalem and He's going to finish His ministry there. So, so when He's going to go to Jerusalem, uh, several things are going to happen. He's going to teach and confront the Pharisees and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, he will have a triumphal entry into the city. He will pronounce judgment on the city. He'll prophesy concerning the future of the city. He will then celebrate the final Passover uh, and initiate the Lord's Supper with his apostles. And then finally, of course, he'll be arrested, falsely convicted, crucified. He will resurrect and then ascend into, into heaven. And since we're not you know, in this study, we're not doing line by line reading, uh, more or less events, and then we pause and, and examine certain passages. I just wanted to give you a flow of the events as Matthew will recount them. In the meantime, while he is in the north, in other words, while he's in safer and more familiar surroundings, Jesus will establish, especially among his apostles now, his true identity. Okay? He's also going to prepare them for the rejection that he's going to suffer at the hands of the leaders and the people when they do go to Jerusalem. So they need to be ready, they need to be pumped up, you know, they need to understand who he is because now they're heading into the eye of the storm when, they find, when he makes his final entry into Jerusalem. Uh, so let's talk about the turning point, shall we, in his ministry. Every story has a dramatic turning point. Uh, authors know this guys who write novels or screenplays, you know, uh, everything's going fine and then, oops, there's a plane crash. And then that kind of you know, uh, introduces tension and drama into the play. Or perhaps someone is arrested or someone is killed. You know? uh, there's a turning point in the, in the story. Well, in Matthew's account, the turning point in Jesus' ministry takes place in two different events. The first event is that he is rejected by his own hometown. So that's a turning point in his ministry. Until Jesus returned to Nazareth, uh, there had been very positive uh, a response to him and his team. You know, people were following him. But we know that the tide is about to turn when the people who knew him best and had not only witnessed his teaching and his miracles, but also his good life growing up, when those people reject him, something has definitely changed. You know, there's like change in the air. All of a sudden, you know, everybody who's applauding him, stop applauding him and begin questioning, uh, begin rejecting him. And then the second event is uh, the death of John the Baptist. Herod kills John the Baptist. So Herod, at the national level, believed that John the Baptist was a popular prophet. He knew John the Baptist's connection with Jesus, and you know what? He had him executed anyways. That's a turning point. This was a clear signal to Jesus of Herod's opposition and contempt. So here he kills a very, very popular prophet openly. And for no, there's no gain here for him. There's nothing to gain. He just kills him. And so this sends a message out to Jesus and His people, and the message is, look what I did to this guy. If I can do this to this guy, 
you better be careful because I can do it to you too. So that's, that's where the, you know, uh, the ministry, the action, if you wish, begins to turn with these two events. So faced with this level of opposition, Jesus steps up his efforts at strengthening his apostles, uh, their faith and their understanding of who he was. So long as he's popular, so long as everybody's you know, following him, you know, they're following the flow. But now that there's going to be an uphill battle, they need to be stronger, they need to be more grounded. Now we've looked at this material last time we were talking, last class, in the context of Jesus' kindness, the idea that as king, Jesus was a servant of those in need. He wasn't a king like earthly kings, you know, who was, they are served and, and they're fawned over and so on and so forth. He was a different kind of king. He, he was a king that actually served his, his people. Uh, and we talked about uh, that last time, all the kind deeds that he did. But from another perspective, we also see that Jesus is building the faith of His apostles to the point where they'll be assured that He is the Lord, He is the Messiah, He is the divine Son of God, yes, and even He is the King. They need to be absolutely sure of this in order to face and survive what is coming very quickly down the road. So we see Him doing this for them in a variety of ways. For example, his miracles for the people. Now the apostles were witnesses of the tremendous miracles Jesus performed for the people who came after Him. You know, the people who followed Him, they may, may have been a witness of one miracle over here and another group, you know, they see another miracle over there in another town, but the apostles are following Him around. They're seeing all the miracles, one after another, all kinds of miracles. The feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the sick, even people touching His robe, becoming well, uh, the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter, the healing of the lame and the blind and the handicapped, feeding yet another crowd of 4,000, uh, healing of an epileptic um, um, upon a father's de desperate request. And I want to read that uh, in Matthew 17. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and he's very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. And so the man's cry for help for his weak faith is a mirror of the apostles' faith. They, they have the same kind of faith. They couldn't heal the kid. Same kind of faith. The and you notice the father said, your apostles, you know, they failed. You know, uh, hey, ever, ever anybody say that to you? Your son or your daughter was at our house. Uh, you know, a little implied accusation there. This is your, your trouble, your business. Your apostle, your disciples, they couldn't heal him. And so uh, their faith was weak, his faith was weak. Um, their faith is not yet complete, pretty much as you know, what he is saying about his apostles at this particular juncture. Now many of these people rejected him, but he continued to minister to them anyways, and in doing so built, for, built up the faith of his apostles. I don't know about you, but if it was me, and they said, your disciples, they couldn't heal them, you know, I'd say, hey, so take it to, you know, bring them to the hospital, you can do better, you know what I'm saying? That's me, that's my flesh talking. So Jesus is you know, demonstrating not only his kindness, but his power to people who are kind of uh, rejecting him and accusing him, and yet he continues to minister to them. That's a very, a very uh, significant thing. Uh, another way that he's trying to help his uh, disciples, uh, in the way that he handles the Jewish leaders. Now most were afraid of these people, but Jesus, the king, showed his authority when he dealt with them and their schemes to destroy him. So, in watching him in the way that he handled the Jewish leaders, they could gain strength and confidence. Again, you know, uh, I, I didn't have brothers and sisters, so if I went to a new school, which I went to a lot of them, you know, and if I got beat up, I, I couldn't say, yeah, I'm going to go get my brother, because there was no brother and there was no sister. 
You know what I'm saying? But in my family, you know, the boys had each other and the girls had each other. So you know, if you messed with one, you, you had all of them on your back. You see? And then there was even a time where Paul was you know, being jumped on by a bunch of kids and Julia ran out of the house and started wailing away. You know? So you got somebody, somebody's got your back. You know? And so in the same way, I'm just trying to give you the feeling, in the same way, you know, they're watching him take care of the people that you know, the leaders that the people were afraid of, and he was, you know, he was uh, admonishing them, and he was not allowing them to uh, overwhelm him with their, with their schemes. And so Jesus' rejection was spearheaded by the Pharisees and the priests, who despite seeing the miracles and hearing the teachings, refused to accept the conclusion that all of these things pointed to. If the guy does miracles, if the guy teaches with authority, there must be something about this guy that's special. They didn't see that. They just said, boy, the miracles he's doing, the teachings he's doing, he's going to replace us. We need to get rid of him. That was, that was their way of thinking. So they wanted to discredit and destroy Jesus in order to protect their position and hide their own sinfulness. That's what they were doing. They didn't teach with authority. They twisted the scriptures to their own advantage. They didn't help the people or provide for them. They, manifest, they manipulated the people in order to maintain their uh, position. More crooked politician than religious leader. Uh, and so Matthew describes several instances where the king handles his accusers and enemies who are out to discredit him. And remember, this, this back and forth with his enemies is always taking place in front of the apostles. Okay? So for example, the accusation of trans, uh, transgressing the tradition in Matthew 15 verses 1 to 20. It says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning there'll be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the sign of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So we looked at this episode last week, where the Pharisees from Jerusalem, who had more authority than the local scribes, came to Galilee and they accused Jesus of violating the tradition concerning the washing of hands. Now when you're talking about the tradition, the tradition or the halakha as it was called was a set of 631 rules. You, know, you think your mom had a lot of rules for you? Imagine 631 rules set as a fence around the law by rabbis in order to make sure that a person didn't actually break the law. It included all kinds of rituals and procedures, rules that were conceived and enforced by religious leaders without any, any authority, from, any authority from, the, from the scriptures. The law of Moses, for example, required no intermarrying. You weren't allowed to marry outside the Jewish nation uh, and certainly no worship with the Gentiles. That's what the law was. Uh, these rabbis, for example, had extended this to include a law where if you even touched something that had been previously touched by a Gentile, you were considered unclean. In some way you had broken the law or you were defiled. And when you were unclean and, and defiled, it meant that you were unable to worship without a long process of washing and rituals in order to right the situation. I mean, I think the word is cumbersome. It was just, oh, did you ever, have you ever had to deal with the federal government with paperwork? Okay, now I see everybody go, oh yeah, sure. I don't want to offend anyone here who works for the federal government. I think people you know, uh, are trying to do a good job. But have you ever tried to deal with Social Security? I mean, really? You know? even, at, even in the best context, is there a lot of paper to, to, to deal with? A lot of paperwork? Well, imagine your religious leaders being like that. All the paperwork, all the fussiness, all the detail, all the stuff that you had to do just, just to kind of be a good, just to be a good Jew. So uh, Jesus handles these accusations concerning this matter. He explains that a person defiles himself when he speaks evil things and does evil things because these things come from the heart. 
What comes from the heart, he says, this evil defiles a man. What he touches or what he eats, this has no power to defile a person. We read that and we go, yeah, sure, we know that. That's, you know, that's, that's no news to us. But if you were a Jew living under that oppressive system, boy, it's like a breath of fresh air. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? You know, people are going, yeah, sure, yeah. How could just touching something defile me spiritually? Of course. So in saying this, Jesus condemns these hypocritical Pharisees because the implication is that they are impure because of their teachings and conduct that did not even square with the word of God. Uh, another instance of this, miracles. <clears throat> the Pharisees ask for a sign in uh, Matthew 16. It says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning there'll be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know, and I read this before, how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the sign of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So this is not the first time that the leaders asked for a sign. They had done this before. But this time they want a demonstration of His power or a special sign or a special signal just for themselves, just for us, they say. The idea being that what He's already done so far, this is not enough, that's for the rabble, that's for the masses. Okay, you multiply bread and you know, fish, big deal. You know? a, you know, a kid is sick, you heal the blind, you know, big deal. We want a sign. You know? Actually, they were looking for a sign like you know, uh, the signs that took place during the time of Moses, the sea parting, manna from heaven, you know, water from earth. They wanted that kind of sign and they wanted it for themselves. You know, they said, look, if you want to appeal to us, you're just going to have to get, you're going to have to up your game here. You have to give us a much better sign. So Jesus responds by condemning their request because first of all, it is an example of disbelief and an evil heart. It's not a sincere request based on a desire to know and believe. You know, Thomas, the apostle, he said, unless I see the nail holes, I won't believe. Thomas wanted to believe. He just says, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm out of breath here. You need to help me here, help my disbelief. Right? This was not the case with these people. Their, theirs was a challenge born out of cynicism. So Jesus knows their hearts and He tells them what sign to look for. You see what I'm saying? He could have just, you know, bzz, I'm not even talking to you people and walk away. But he, he kind of tells them the sign that they're to look for. And he says the sign of Jonah. We know what that is, of course. The sign of Jonah, Jonah the prophet who was three days in the belly of the fish and then was returned. This was a sign or a parallel or a type, if you wish, of the resurrection. Now the prophet said that the true sign of the legitimate Messiah would be his resurrection. That's what you had to look for. Uh, Acts chapter 2.31 and 2 Romans 1, 1 to 4, Paul tells us that the, the thing to look for, the discerning thing, that the, the, the defining thing to prove that Jesus is the Son of God is His resurrection. Yes, there are miracles and yes, there is wonderful teaching and yes, there's the kindness and there's the love and there's the sacrifice. Yes, there's all of that, but the defining sign on which we rest our faith is the resurrection. So if someone were to say, well, what one thing should, should I believe? Well, the Bible says, Romans chapter uh, four, uh, the Bible says uh, the resurrection is that. And so in handling these men, the point I'm making here is in handling these men, the king prepares his disciples not only by building their faith in him, but also by showing them who their enemies will be in the future. It's not just watch how I handle these guys. He's saying watch for these guys because if they're talking to me, the one who does the miracles in this way, imagine what they're going to do to you. Okay? And then uh, he doesn't, you know what I'm talking about here, right? I'm talking about the different ways that Jesus is building up His apostles, building their faith. Another way that He does it is miracles that were performed only for them. So a lot of the miracles they witnessed that He did for others, but there were some miracles that were specifically for the apostles, 
For example, walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14. Now we covered this miracle before where Jesus comes to His apostles who are in a boat rowing against the storm. They're afraid at first, but Peter comes out, you know the story, for a while and he takes a couple of steps on the water before doubting and then needing Jesus to save him from sinking. In the end, this miracle moves all of the apostles to worship and declare Jesus as the divine Lord, a level of faith that they had not yet reached before that episode. That miracle was just for them. Another miracle that was just for them was the transfiguration. Let's read that passage. It says, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is good for us to be here, if you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So Peter, James, and John witnessed the visual brightness of Jesus' divine nature and His ability to communicate beyond time and the material dimension. They're looking into another dimension when they see the scene before them. And what is the Lord doing here? He's speaking with Moses and Elijah. Why Moses and Elijah? Because they each represent something. Moses represents the confirmation of his presence, meaning Jesus' presence and person, from the law and the prophets, right? Moses, the law of Moses. So Moses is witnessing that Jesus is the one, okay, because he represents the law and the prophets, and then, uh, the law rather, and then Elijah, he represents the prophets, a great prophet from the Old uh, from the Old Testament. So the fact that Jesus is there and they witness another dimension here taking place and they see these two characters, the message to them is Jesus is a Messiah according to the law represented by Moses and the prophets represented by Elijah. Okay? Now Luke writes about this event and so interestingly he says that, that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were discussing His, uh, his uh, uh, crucifixion. They were talking about Jesus' crucifixion. Interesting little point that uh, Luke makes in his uh, gospel. So the voice from heaven also confirms Jesus' role as one who fulfills all prophecy and law. And the instruction to hear Him is to listen to Jesus as the final authority and the final word of law and prophecy. He fulfills and supersedes these two. Yes, you had the law and you were listening to Moses. And yes, you had the prophets and you were listening to the prophets. Well now, Jesus supersedes and fulfills these two. And you know what's interesting? All new religions, right? All new religions have the same basis. And the basis is a new prophet a new prophet. It doesn't matter if it's Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or any obscure sect, uh, even Islam. You know, I'm not even talking about within the context of Christianity. All new religions begin with a prophet. Somebody who says, you know what? God came and talked to all these guys in the past, but now God has spoken to me. And now we have the Book of Mormon, and now, because I've heard Mormons say that, you know, they say, well, yeah, the Bible's good, but the Book of Mormon, that's what we got to go with. Why? Because you know, this is the latest from God. And if you ever read it, you'd say, really? Really? So it's always the same thing. That's why John said you know, that you have to test the spirit. Test the spirits, he say. And those who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, they're part of the Antichrist, very simple. So every one of these new religions, when you scratch the surface and really dig down, 
and you ask them, tell me who Jesus is. Well, he's a son of God. Oh, what does that mean, a son of God? Well, he was actually a man first and then he became God. Oh, well, no, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible teaches. So just remember that, okay? This passage here, the transfiguration, was for them, but it's for us too. God is also saying to us, hear him. There are going to be other voices and other prophets, but he's the one that you have to hear. The other thing too is none of the other Johnny-come-latelys have risen from the dead. They're still dead. The prophets, the ones who saw visions in caves, the ones who received plates and so on, they're all dead. Our Lord, our King, He's alive. We have witnesses of His resurrection. Okay, uh, more miracles. Remember I said, he, remember, remember what the point of the lesson here, Jesus is building the strength of the apostles. One of the ways He does it is through private miracles. The coin and the fish, for example, in Matthew 17, 24, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax, tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? And he said, yes. And when he came, he lied, because he didn't know, he was afraid. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. That must have been so difficult. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everything you said and do, he knows, you know, and he, he, he calls you on it. You know? Very difficult. Uh, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From who do kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However, so that uh, we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and for me. So Peter is questioned to see if he pays temple tax and Jesus tells Peter to go fish and explains that when he does so he's going to find a coin in its mouth and he's going to pay the tax for both of them. That's a miracle. That's a miracle like just between Peter and Jesus. The idea here is that it is ridiculous for Jesus, the Son of God, the King, to pay tax on His own temple. But to avoid offending those weak in the faith, He instructs Peter to pay it, but with a sign obtained in a miraculous way, with a coin rather, obtained in a miraculous way. Of course, those who didn't believe, didn't accept Jesus, only saw a young teacher pay his dues. Oh yeah, oh that Jesus, yeah, he pays. He pays like everybody else. The apostles, however, Peter, received yet another demonstration of Jesus' power to bolster their faith in understanding who He was. I'm moving quickly. Another way Jesus is establishing His true identity, building the faith of His apostles. Miracles for the people, handling the Jewish leaders, miracles for His apostles, and then special teaching. Special teaching. Teaching that the masses were not privy to. For example, the lesson about pure and impure in chapter 15. After chastising the Pharisees about their hypocrisy concerning their tradition, Jesus explains privately this time to the apostles why food did not defile. And this insight gave them the normal and moral authority to refute the Jewish leaders later on. Later on they had the power and the knowledge and the insight not only to refute their false teaching, but why their teaching was false, why it was ridiculous. Uh, warnings about the Pharisees. He warns them about the Pharisees. We read this in discussing Jesus' answer to the Pharisees in their request for a sign. Note, however, that after this incident, when Jesus is alone with the apostles, He uses this incident as an example to warn them about these men. Jesus, in pointing to His miraculous feeding of the 4,000 and then to the work of the Pharisees, is in effect asking His apostles to compare the two and realize who has the real power. He said, you saw me feed the 4,000 and you heard what I taught them? Okay, you've got that on this side and you have had a lifetime of listening to the Pharisees and observing their work. All I'm asking you to do is compare the two and ask yourself, who's got the power here? Who's speaking God's word? Who represents God? Now remember, for them that's difficult. You grow up your whole life. These are the priests. These are the religious leaders. These are the wise men. These are the ones you have to obey. You think that's, 
that's easy to do. Uh, do you know any of our Catholic friends or others that come from other types of uh, uh, religions, how difficult it is for them to kind of get over the emotional and cultural uh, hold that those things have on them. So it was the same thing for the, um, for the apostle. Who has the power? Who has the wisdom? The king or, or, or the religious leaders that you now follow? Another special teaching is a response to Peter's confession in, um, verse, uh, in chapter 16, 13, 13 to 20, let's see if I've got some scripture there. Yeah, it says, uh, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of the living God. So we see another climactic moment the miracles, the response to the leaders, the special teachings that they have witnessed and received have built their faith to, these, to this point where upon being asked, Peter confesses the true and perfect confession of faith, doesn't he? Now, if we were to go back a couple of chapters before all this special instruction started, I don't know if Peter, you know, I don't know what Peter would have said, but after this special you know, ministry that Jesus is specifically doing on their behalf, Peter's ready to make the good confession of faith. Speaking ahead of the others, he declares in clear and unmistakable language what the parables and the miracles and the teachings were all pointing to from the beginning, that Jesus is the divine Messiah. The King is recognized finally for who He is. Now at this point, Jesus teaches them beyond the point of simple confession of faith. He teaches them also that without the revelation of the Son through the teaching and miracles that, that they have been witness to, Peter would have never known this. He would have never known that Jesus is the Messiah. Human wisdom cannot discern God's will and plan without revelation from God Himself. That's why the gospel is powerful. It reveals the will of God, which is salvation through faith in Christ. My point is, Human beings without the Bible could not have figured out by themselves that the God who created the world absolved them of moral guilt through a vicarious atonement of a God becoming a man. No. I mean, don't we see the kind of religion that men create? You know, Islam, that's a man-made religion. Take a look at it. And if you're a woman, really take a look at it. Mormonism, Jehovah, we, take a look at these religions. These were made up by human beings. And look at the individuals and the things that they are forced to do. And so Jesus tells them, you know, Peter, you wouldn't have known this unless my father revealed it to you, meaning unless he sent me to teach and to do miracles and so on and so forth. You, you couldn't have figured out the quote plan of salvation by yourself. And then he talks about you know, Simon and he, he changes his name to Peter. This is where he does it. Simon, the old man, the man Jesus originally called out to, uh, to uh, is truly a blessed person because of the confession he's just made. He gives him a new name, Peter, the new man, the rock man. He'll be a lot stronger. He'll be better because of this confession. You know, the, it's a play on words. Simon means a stone or a pebble. Peter means a rock, actually means a cliff. You know. Before you were this little rock over here in the stream. Now you're like this, this cliff over here. You're a rock of a, a man, a person. And this revelation which Peter has formally declared in his confession of faith will be the basis or the rock upon which Jesus will build his church the called out. Now, if Jesus wanted to say he was to build his church upon Peter, which uh, Catholics believe, the construction of the sentence would have been, and upon thee I will build my church, if he was going to build it on Peter. But the rock upon which the indestructible church was to be built was the reality and fact that Jesus is the divine Messiah, not just the acknowledgement of that fact. You understand what I'm saying? The rock upon which the church is built 
is Jesus Christ and who He is, not what we think about Him. The church is built upon a person, Jesus, not a doctrine. All right, it's important to remember that. And then Jesus continues to teach them further by um, uh, outlining the ministry that they're going to have. You know, he talks about the keys of the kingdom. Keys of the kingdom is the authority to open the doors of heaven, kingdom, a key. What's the key to the kingdom? It's the gospel message, that's the key, that's what opened the door. Uh, well, do we have another key? Yeah, the Holy Spirit that powers the message, that's the key, opens the door to heaven, okay. The imagery of keys comes from Isaiah and David, the key to the throne equals authority. And then binding and loosening, you know where you bind in on earth is bound in heaven and so on and so forth. The binding and loosening is the authority to speak to men on behalf of God. And so the inspired writings which define Christian life, the gospel which brings forgiveness of sins, it wasn't their authority, it was the authority of the word which God spoke through them. They have the keys and they use the keys, they preach the gospel, they teach the word that opens the door to the kingdom of heaven. So this further teaching in response to Peter's confession solidifies Jesus' role as king over his kingdom and the future tasks that he, his authority gives to these men. One last thing here before we keep going, whoops. And that is the prophecy concerning the crucifixion. In other words, remember what we're talking about. What are the things Jesus did to build up the apostles, right? Okay, so one of the things was the prophecy concerning the crucifixion. One last method of teaching Jesus uses, and that's prophecy. Now the prophets wrote that the single most important sign of the, of the true Messiah was to be His resurrection, not His miracles. So to prepare them for this last and, uh, last and greatest proof of His person, Jesus prophesied no less than three times in Matthew about His eventual death and subsequent resurrection. Once in Matthew 16, 21, once in Matthew 17, 9, another time Matthew 17, 22. This was done not only for them, but also for our instruction as well, because with these prophecies, Jesus taught them and teaches us several important lessons about Himself specifically and about discipleship in general. I'll leave you with these, a, little, a lot of material in this particular lesson here, so if you'll bear with me another moment. A couple of lessons that he teaches by prophesying his own death and resurrection. First of all, for Christ and his followers, death would come, but it'll be followed by a glorious resurrection. Secondly, the cost of salvation for him and discipleship is very high. And then the third lesson, all of this, his resurrection as well as our own, was all according to God's word, Matthew 17, 10. And so <clears throat> with a mixture of faith in Him as the divine Messiah, King of the kingdom of heaven, and knowledge of the sacrifice uh, this title was going to cost Him, the apostles were ready to leave the relatively safe surroundings of Galilee in order to be with the King as He travels to the city of the King and eventually to the cross awaiting the King. So these are some of the ways that Jesus built up His apostles preparing them not only to witness the, uh, the crucifixion, but also to maintain faith after His death and you know, that, that in-between time uh, of His resurrection. Okay, that's it for this time. Thank you very much.